You're muted, Dave. Good morning. I'm so happy to see you here and so happy to be here. I'm David Stewart, a worship associate here at Northwest Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Sandy Springs, Georgia. Northwest Unitarian Universalist Congregation seeks to create love and community, inspire joy and spiritual growth, and to support courageous action. All are welcome as together we journey towards justice by, and equity by learning, caring, and acting together. We especially welcome any newcomers and visitors we have today, and welcome all of you to turn on your cameras so as to better see our community together. I have a few announcements for you as well. Join us for our first Northwest game night on Zoom on August 20th from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. We will be playing Kahoot, an online interactive trivia game. Sign up to play by August 19th by using the link in the Universe newsletter. And if you don't have that newsletter, please feel free to send a note to office at northwestuc.org and they will sign you up for the newsletter. There will be a lot of volunteer, physical volunteer activity near the end of this month to get final approval from the city of Sandy Springs for our almost complete building expansion. We need volunteers and this means you. We need volunteers with chainsaws, we need volunteers with weed eaters, we need volunteers who can maneuver landscaping equipment, and we need volunteers to help lay bricks in our dry lay brick patio. Please contact any member of the Building Expansion Committee to coordinate your much appreciated volunteer hours to the congregation. If you have anyone in need of fulfilling volunteer hours for their schools or other organizations, please send them to us. We will be starting virtual chalice groups as well, our small group experiences soon. Pre please contact Brian Freeman to find out more about these. I hope you'll join us after worship for coffee hour from the comfort of your own homes. The link to our coffee hour Zoom room will appear in the chat box toward the end of worship and we will remind you about it there again. In fact, you won't even have to change rooms. So when you, uh, if you wait until after, immediately after the service, you won't have to do anything, but just wait until we start that coffee hour. Uh, again, you'll be reminded in the chat at the end of the service. If you haven't already, now is a great time to grab whatever materials you'll need to light your own chalice if you'd like that to be part of your worship experience today. As always, kindly set your phones to worship mode. We don't know, but I think you might enjoy the hour free from distractions. And feel free to check in on your social media of choice to let your friends and family know about this place of caring that you've found today. Our congregation is an exciting place to be, and we love it when you share the good news. Although we cannot physically be together to greet each other today with hugs, high fives, smiles, and words of love, we are all together in spirit, and each and every one of us is welcome. Hannah will now call us to worship. Good morning. Our call to worship this morning is entitled, Hope Rises. It was written by John A. Burens and Rebecca Parker. Hope rises. It rises from the heart of life here and now, beating with joy and sorrow. Hope longs. It longs for good to be affirmed, for justice and love to prevail, for suffering to be alleviated, and for life to flourish in peace. Hope remembers. It remembers the dreams of those who have gone before and reaches for connection with them across the boundary of death. Hope acts. It acts to bless, to protest, and to repair. And now Avery Lockhart will light our chalice, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith as we gather for worship.
Love Can Transform the World by Maureen Killeran. Love is the aspiration, the spirit that moves and inspires this faith we share. Rightly understood, love can nurture our spirits and transform the world. May the flame of this chalice honor and embody the power and the blessing of the love we need, the love we give, the love we are challenged always to remember and to share. Thank you, Avery. Good morning. My name is Adia Fields Udofia, and I am the Director of Religious Education for Children and Youth here at Northwest. It warms my heart that you are here with us this morning. Today we are going to be talking about safety. What do you think about when you hear the word safety? Please um, share your ideas in the chat. What comes to mind when you hear the word safety? I think of being warm and cozy. Uh, my safe place is my room. Um, being seen, being heard. Well, there's someone by the name of Abraham Maslow, and he had an idea about human needs, including safety. And his idea actually became famous. It's called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And in his idea, he talks about different levels of needs that are important for us to have so that we can have a healthy body and a healthy mind, which helps us to be the best that we can be. So right now, I'd like to demonstrate um, what is included in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So the first level actually is our basic needs, and that includes food, water, breathing, and sleep. So that reminds me of the color blue. Next, we have our safety needs, being in a safe environment, feeling protected from harm, and this includes safety of our bodies, safety of our emotions, and safety of our minds. Next, we have our social needs. Social needs include love and belonging, having friendships, family, and welcoming others into our lives. So love and belonging, that makes me think of the color red. Next, we have esteem. And that means having confidence in ourselves, feeling respected by others, and also providing respect to other people. Once all of these needs are met, we have our physical needs, we have our safety needs, we have love and belonging and esteem. At the very top, we have self-actualization. That's a pretty big word, but basically that means we can be creative, have fun with our lives, feel content, and use our skills and talents to reach our full potential. If you notice, here is where we have safety needs. I bet you can imagine what might happen if I removed our safety needs. Everything else would come toppling over or would fall down. Safety needs are so important, they actually come next after water and breathing. Um, so safety is really important to our overall health and well-being. Today, for our story, a young girl named Whimsy had a problem, and her problem seemed so big and so heavy, no matter what she tried to do, she couldn't get rid of it on her own. But in this story, we see how Whimsy feels safe sharing with a friend. And once she does that, she's able to open up to someone who loves her 
and she's able to get rid of her heavy things. So now I'd like to share my screen and we will enjoy Whimsy's Heavy Things. Hey everyone, welcome back to Share Story Corner. Today I will be reading Whimsy's Heavy Things by Julie Crowless. Whimsy's Heavy Things. For Mama and Poppy, who have made my heavy things light time and time again. Whimsy's Heavy Things were weighing her down. She knew she needed to do something, but she wasn't sure what. I will hide them, she said. So Whimsy swept the heavy things under the rug but she tripped over them when she ran to answer the phone. I will hang them in a tree, she said, so Whimsy hoist the heavy things onto a branch. But the next time she walked by, the heavy things fell. I will fly them high in the sky for the clouds to swallow, she said. So Whimsy attached the heavy things to her kite, but when a big gust of wind came along. The kite did not move. I'll float them to sea, she said. So Whimsy made a boat and placed the heavy things in it. But the heavy things sank the umbrella and she stubbed her toe when she was swimming. I'll pretend they're not there, she said. So Whimsy went about her day trying to ignore the heavy things, but she was too weighed down. Her feet and heart felt hev were heavy. Her eyes filled with tears. Try as she might, Whimsy just couldn't make the heavy things disappear. Maybe I'm trying to deal with too many heavy things at once, Whimsy said. She took the first heavy thing and looked at it carefully. She had an idea. She could break the heavy things into smaller pieces. So she did. And with the pieces, pieces, Whimsy made marbles for her best friend. Whimsy broke up the second heavy thing and planted the pieces in the garden where they grew into a beautiful peach tree. Whimsy used pieces of the third heavy thing to build steps to see over the tallest wall. When Whimsy broke up the fourth heavy thing, she began to feel lighter, so much lighter she could swim faster than ever. And she kept the pieces of the last heavy thing as a reminder not to get weighed down by heavy things. Because Whimsy had discovered that heavy things were just light things in disguise. The end. As we learn from Whimsy, it's helpful to get rid of those heavy things and to have a safe place. Maybe it's a person or a community to help us to put a Band-Aid on those heavy things. Not to just cover it up, but a safe covering so that we can heal. We are all worthy of healing and feeling whole so that we can actually reach our full potential and achieve self-actualization. As we listen to a piano solo by Jim Pierce entitled Building Bridges, I invite you to think of, to take some deep breaths and think about the people in your life who help you to feel safe.
Our reading today is entitled Some Thoughts on Healing and was written by Rachel Naomi Remen, MD. She is one of the best known of the early pioneers of holistic and integrative medicine. As a medical educator, therapist, and teacher, she has enabled many thousands of physicians to practice medicine from the heart and thousands of patients to remember their power to heal. She was diagnosed with Crohn's disease at age 15. In 1962, when I graduated from medical school, the goal of medicine was cure. Anything less was failure. But there is a great deal more to wholeness than recovery of physical health and so much more to medicine than curing disease. Not everything can be cured. Fortunately, cure is not the only successful outcome of our relationships to our patients. Over time, I've come to think of physical health not as a goal, but as a means that enables people to pursue what meaning and value in life. But people often do this whether they're physically healthy or not. People even respond to significant illness by growing in their capacity to love and feel compassion for others in their sensitivity and understanding, and in their courage and passion and wisdom. Because of this, they may be able to affect the world around them in ways that would not have been possible before. Over the past 55 years, many physicians have failed to cure me, but many have helped me to heal. Healing is a potential in all relationships and at all times. Our power to heal is far less limited than our power to cure. Healing is not a relationship between an expert and a problem. It is a relationship between human beings. In the presence of another whole person, no one needs feel ashamed of their present pain or weakness and separated by, from others by it. No one needs to feel alone and small. To help others heal, we need to bring our own wholeness with us into our examining rooms, our strengths, our courage, our caring, our vulnerability, even at times our anger and our fears. We may need to become more than we have been trained to be. Our training may have caused us to focus so narrowly on our professional skills that we have sold both ourselves and our patients short. Perhaps our power to make a difference in the lives of others is far greater than the sum of our techniques and expertise. Perhaps we contend the will to live in others with just our bare hands. According to Jung, wounded people are healed by other wounded people. Other wounded people understand that what is needed for the healing of suffering is compassion and companionship, not expertise. Many times my expertise has been far less critical to the eventual outcome for my patient than my presence and my remembering the hidden capacity for wholeness in myself and everyone else, even under extraordinary circumstances. I am humbled by how often what helps a patient find themselves and their strength in hard times and begin the direction of a new life has nothing to do with my hard-won medical knowledge. I have often made a difference because of something I learned in, about life in my garden or from my Russian grandmother or even from my own dark times. Remembering the power of our own humanity and the power of the humanity of our patients opens doors of possibility. To quote Bruce Barton, nothing splendid has ever been achieved except by those who have dared to believe that something in them was superior to circumstance. I believe this about my patients, something long before they can begin to believe it about themselves. And now we have Reverend Joan Davis to present Joys and Sorrows. Thank you and good morning. But thank you, David, for that stunning reading. It is much appreciated. I'm Joan Davis, Northwest Community Minister, and I'm here to bring to you this morning's joys and sorrows. This is our time in this space 
to honor those sacred moments and milestones. For our ritual, we have water and we have river stones. Smooth and heavy in our hands, the river stones symbolize life's pleasures and times of ease, as well as those times of burdens and heaviness. The water in our bowl is a precious natural resource. We use it sparingly. Mindful that the water is precious as our lives. Each individual unique life is precious, each on its own journey. I now invite you all, those of you who will, uh, to go to the chat and share with the congregation here gathered virtually what joys and sorrows you might have. Those joys and sorrows will be printed in Friday's issue of the universe, but otherwise shared here with those gathered this morning. The first stone is a joy, is a, a stone of sorrow, again for Jean Johnson, Northwest member who passed away at age 91 last week. Uh, she passed away at the home of her daughter, Helen Stanowitz, in Sugar Hill, Georgia. She was in hospice care at the time, but only just briefly. Jean and Roger Johnson were longtime members at Northwest. Uh, please keep in mind Jean's family, uh, her daughters, Helen and Ellie Johnson. Uh, Ellie was also a former member at Northwest. Also, I'd ask you to remember Marty Wilson's nephew, Ryan. Uh, Ryan is a veteran of Afghanistan and Iraq, multiple tours, who is still at Kennestone Hospital in Marietta. He will not be released to a rehab facility until he's tested negative for the virus twice. However, on Thursday, he learned that his mother, Lynn Wilson, had admitted herself to a hospice facility and passed away with COVID that very day. This is for Lynn Wilson, Ryan Wilson, Marty and their family. Um, there'll be contact information for Ryan uh, as well as uh, Jean and Roger Johnson's family in the Friday universe. Uh, I think um, cards and notes would be most welcomed by those families. But now I'll add an additional stone for those joys and sorrows, which may be held in silence in our hearts and may go unexpressed among us. Joy and woe are woven fine, a clothing for the soul divine. Under every grief and pine runs a joy with silken twine. Be well, stay safe, and know that you are loved. We have now reached a time in the service of prayer and meditation. Please make yourself comfortable and join me in a brief meditation. Our words this morning are adapted from Alice and Acheka Naisman's Meditation on Hope and Love in a Time of Struggle. This morning, let us simply breathe together as we hold our hearts open. Breathing in as our hearts fill with compassion. Breathing out 
as we pray for healing in our world and in our lives. Breathing in, opening ourselves to the transforming power of love. <sighs> Breathing out as we pray for peace in our world and in our lives. Breathing in as we hold hope in our hearts. <sighs> Breathing out as we pray for justice in our world and in our lives. May we know our strength. May we be filled with courage. May our love flow from us into this world. Breathing in, we are the prayer. Breathing out, we are the healing. Breathing in, we are the love. Breathing out, we are the peace. Breathing in, we are the hope. Breathing out, we are the justice. May we know our strength. May we be filled with courage. May our love flow from us into this world. Amen. Blessed be. May it ever be so. Good morning, everyone. In a time when we may struggle to see hope and love each day, this morning I'm going to speak straight from my heart and share some personal experiences that have pushed me and shaped me. I will be talking about some hard topics. Please be kind to yourself and take appropriate care as we discuss. Remember that Reverend Misha is available for conversations and this community is here for you as well. I'm hoping you receive this as a message of reassurance and inspiration 
that this is our life to live. And that just as one person's pain can hurt us all, one person's healing has the power to transform us all. A year ago, we were celebrating calling Reverend Misha to be our settled minister. One of the first sermons she delivered from our beautiful pulpit at Northwest last June touched me in a unique way. And that's where I wanna start. It was a sermon about Mordecai and Esther. Mordecai, a Jew who from outside of a castle infused love and courage to their cousin Esther, an orphan who was stolen off the streets by a king and enslaved inside the walls. Esther was an orphaned child, taken away from the only family they knew and forced into sexual slavery. With years of Mordecai's prayers, Esther found the courage to speak up, saving their own life and the lives of all the Jews. Reverend Misha's sermon title was For Such a Time as This. And she encouraged us to listen to the calling of our souls and to take faith that we may have been built for such a time as this. And that the positive changes and impact each one of us make individually may in fact have the potential to heal our world. Reverend Misha found a place in my heart that day for her incredible ability to preach and to bring inspiring stories to life. I'm so thankful that we have her. We, the big we, become stronger as each of us heal and find our true voices. You don't remember, because I never told you, that on that day last year, I was healing from a deep pain myself after having a life-saving visit with my own cousin just the day before. I sat there on one of our cush green chairs that I never thought I'd miss, miss as much as I do now <laughs> as Reverend Misha presented a story of two cousins finding strength, healing, and purpose together and doing the impossible. While less than 24 hours earlier, I had found what felt like similar strength, healing, and purpose with my own cousin, who was not a caretaker for me like Mordecai. He was actually my abuser. And after 30-something years of suffering, the healing that began that day felt every bit as big as what I imagine saving an empire may feel like. We cried together, and I learned that he had been hurting all of these years, too. It was the hardest thing I have ever done. And in the midst of the shared pain we were sorting through that day, I felt my heart break open. The world shift, and true and deep healing begin. For 30 years, I had built enormous walls to protect our secret. I didn't realize that those walls had also been protecting my pain, sheltering it from healing, and providing a fertile ground for it to grow and seep into every area of my life. After all of those years of avoiding his gaze at family functions, I had no idea that his eyes were a beautiful blue. I had never let myself look at them. Healing can be such hard work that it physically feels like breaking completely open. That day, I got close to where I hurt the most. Dr. Emily Nagoski, counselor and professor of women's sexuality says that, quote, healing always involves pain. You can't choose for your broken heart not to hurt any more than you can choose for a broken bone not to hurt. But you can recognize that that pain is a part of the healing. And you can trust your heart to heal just as you trust your bones to heal. 
knowing that it will gradually hurt less and less as you recover. She encourages us to choose to allow the hurt to heal. In his book titled, It Didn't Start With You, Mark Wolin stated, quote, when we try to resist feeling something painful, we often protract the very pain we're trying to avoid. Doing so is a prescription for continued suffering. He goes on to say, in many ways, healing from trauma is akin to creating a poem. Both require the right timing, the right words, and the right image. When these elements align, something meaningful is set into motion that can be felt in the body. So let's talk about the hard work of healing and our roles as individuals and as a community in that process. I'm sure most of us are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs that Adia beautifully introduced in Story Wisdom. Maslow developed that theory in the 1940s and 1950s. He said that only after our needs for food, water, warmth, safety, belongingness and love, self-esteem and accomplishment are satisfied. Only then can we work towards self-fulfillment and achieving our full potential. And they have to be accomplished in that order. A couple of weeks ago, our middle and high school members arranged a beautiful service about their spiritual practices. And we had some small group conversations that delved into more detail. I got to lead one of the breakouts with these questions. What makes you feel safe and included in a community? And what makes you feel unsafe or excluded? I chose these questions because Maslow says finding belongingness and love, some of our foundational reasons for being in a faith community, finding those things is not possible without feeling safe and secure. We cannot ask ourselves or each other to go places that hurt when we are also having to keep our guard up. Touching our pain requires us to break down the walls that we've built around our castles or at least to create a little crack to peek through. And how could we do that if there are arrows right outside the walls pointing straight at our most vulnerable places? How can we dream of doing that if our other, more basic needs for safety aren't met? Maslow doesn't believe that we can. And based on the notes I took during our breakout session last week, I think many of you agree. Here are some of the things that you said make you feel safe. You said you feel safe when people understand you and appreciate you. When you don't feel like a stranger. When you have shared background and experiences. You said you feel safe when people truly and deeply listen to you. When you feel free to speak openly knowing that people won't laugh at you and that they will be open-minded. You said that seeing other people being vulnerable, making mistakes, and being received with love makes you feel safe. And you stated that you feel safe knowing that if you are not able to do something on your own, there will be someone there to help you, to support you when times are hard, knowing that when you are vulnerable and exposed, you won't be alone. And finally, you said that in order to feel truly safe, you need to know that your loved ones will also be safe in the group as well. In our reading, the author referred to Carl Jung, a really famous guy that you may have heard of, who believed that wounded people are healed by other wounded people. Other wounded people understand that what is needed for healing and suffering is compassion and companionship. I believe that we are all wounded, but sometimes we can work so hard to avoid our pain, we may forget it. 
though we can work toward healing on our own, we need other wounded people, the safety and security of community to really get to the good stuff. I've been a number, in a number of hard conversations recently related to our UU faith, related to the denomination as a whole and our small, beautiful little chunk of it at Northwest. In some of those conversations, I've heard encouragement for us to not expect safety because we cannot guarantee it. And that instead of safety, we need people to be brave. While I don't disagree that doing hard things requires immense courage, I want to offer that the healing I believe we all crave, the deep healing that requires other wounded people to bring us compassion and companionship, that healing cannot take place unless we feel safe. Picture that castle with the big walls we've built up and arrows shooting at it. Being brave is saying we need to pump ourselves up inside the gate and run out into a firestorm. And yeah, truly facing our deepest pain does feel exactly like that in the moment. I felt it as I walked into that meeting with my cousin. And I'm sure Esther felt it just before they laid out the proposition that would save the Jews, not knowing if it would work or if it would result in their demise. But these moments came years, came after years and years of building courage, building confidence by peeking through the cracks in our walls and building a sense of safety, by seeing other people be vulnerable and get stronger. We cannot expect each other to be brave continuously. We are human. We must create relationships that are safe in order to heal. And I believe this is more important today than perhaps it has ever been. In the reading, Dr. Riemann said, quote, healing is a potential in all relationships and at all times. It is a relationship between human beings. In the presence of another whole person, no one needs to feel ashamed of their present pain or weaknesses and be separated from others by it. No one needs to feel alone and small. So my question is, how are we doing this as individuals and as a faith community? As Mark Wolin said, to heal, our pacing must be in tune and many elements must align. Dr. Nagoski refers to pain and healing as being natural cycles. They say that recovery requires an environment of relative security so that the panic and rage can discharge, completing their cycles at last. It's so hard to know where others are in their healing process. If they've just begun, if they're still actively building walls, or if they're ready to start pulling those walls down. So the safety within our community is more than important. It's essential. It deserves our attention. The only reason I had the courage to talk with my cousin that day was because I had built that courage over years and years leading up to it. And a lot of it came from the confidence I developed being in community with all of you. And you didn't even know it. Every time I stood in front of you at meetings or during service, I was peeking through the cracks in my walls and building strength. What are we doing as individuals and as a faith community to help the elements align for healing for others? Where do we see people begging for their basic needs of food, warmth, and safety? Are we listening or are we looking away? Where do we see people crying for their psychological needs of belongingness and self-esteem? Can we give them the floor? Belongingness requires us to feel heard and accepted. 
Are we making space to hear and learn and accept? We said in the breakout sessions that we feel safe in a community when we have shared experiences and background with others. It's like there's a connection that doesn't require words. How are we creating a space for others to find that connection when they come in our doors, virtual or the ones with knobs? Are we creating a diverse community that digs deeper in our relationships to find the shared background and experiences that can lead us to feeling connected? Are we challenging ourselves to find connection in our uniqueness? And what about each of us individually? Do we know where our own walls are? How high have we built them? Do we have enough self-awareness to know and be able to express when our basic needs need attention? Are we doing our own hard work of healing? I believe that even the hardest and the most painful healing is possible. It does not require us to sit down with people who have hurt us or save an empire but it does require us to find the walls that are protecting our pain and to work to break them down. And the scientific side of our UU minds will be happy to know that there's research to back this up. Most of you know that I've just completed my first semester at GSU pursuing a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. I'm doing this because of the transformative experiences I have had in therapy and counseling over the past 10 years. Actually, my first therapist is the whole reason why I am a UU. Research in the field of mental health has identified that trauma relives, resurfaces, or replays until we actually hear it, until we allow it to complete the cycle. Researchers now believe that trauma can actually change our biology, how our neurons fire, and even how our genes are expressed. And not just for us, but some research points to multi-generational effects, that people can show signs of trauma that their grandparents experienced without ever having met them. And the research also shows that our bodies heal. Our brains continue to learn throughout our life and our cellular expressions respond to safety. There's a concept called post-traumatic growth that states that people are able to turn the most profoundly painful experiences into deep and fulfilling growth. They tell stories of seeing the sun shine brighter, feeling full and alert, and finding deeper connection in relationships. You may be thinking, thinking of an experience that you've had where you've felt more clarity after a painful experience. There's also tons of attention and effort going, going to studying the concept of resilience and how our spiritual lives and our faith community like ours can positively impact and help us find meaning in even the hardest times. I'm only one semester into my studies, so I am not a pro, but my understanding of these concepts and my personal experience is that healing is the hardest work we may ever do. Healing requires a safe space for us to touch and process our deepest pain. Healing is necessary for us to reach our full potential. And most importantly, healing is possible. Regardless of how long ago, how big, how small, we can heal. Just think about the potential. This is what inspires me every single day. Think about the potential in all of us if we work towards healing. There is such physical and emotional pain around us and in us. What if we choose to allow that hurt to heal? If healing in one person can save an empire, what can we do collectively? 
So let's leave here today with inspiration to do the hard work of healing for ourselves and for each other. To get support when we need it from friends, therapists, ministers, family, puppies, or even kitty cats, as long as they consent. <laughs> let's leave here committed to creating a safe space when people are hurting and to realize that as we do so, we are changing the world. Thank you. And now let's enjoy our director of music, Dr. Philip Roger Rogers, as he performs Healing Balm. May we be a healing balm to the nations, a healing balm to the peoples of the earth, so the world will know of the healing power in love. May true healing flow through us. nations, a ray of hope to the peoples of the earth, so the world will know of the healing power in love. May true light and hope now shine through us. May we be a healing balm to the nations. So the world will know of the healing power in love. May true healing flow through us. What a Wonderful song. Good job, Dr. Philip. The offering that we take each Sunday isn't just a stale habit. It's an opportunity to recommit to this place, Northwest. Today, this virtual place, but our place nonetheless. And to this people, our offering is an affirmation, a yes. When we give, we say yes to something we value with our gifts freely given, we, may we say yes to the fat values of our faith. May our text to give offering help us practice Unitarian Universalism within and beyond our congregation as tools to empower our mission. Please check the chat for the text to give instructions. Our offering will now be given and gratefully received.
to the work of this congregation, which is weaving a tapestry of love and action, we dedicate our offerings and the best of who we are. Before our benediction, I'd like to invite you to participate in coffee hour again, uh, which will begin immediately after our service. You can stay right here when the service ends. There's no need to click off or come back. Uh, we'll begin as soon as the postlude is over. Our parting words today are from the writer, poet, civil rights activist, and childhood sexual trauma survivor, Dr. Maya Angelou, who gave voice to the profound impacts of trauma and the lifelong struggle to heal. Through her groundbra groundbreaking autobiography, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. Dr. Angelo said, quote, as soon as healing takes place, go out and heal someone else. May it be so.